Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for taking a break from following the election results to join us today. As we wait for more people to long on, I wanted to thank you for being here to mark the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and to honor his legacy. I'm Rachel Rosen for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our entire staff, our president, Mark Melman, our board, and our board co-chairs, Ann Lewis and Todd Richmond, who are with us today, welcome. We hope you and your loved ones are staying well and are staying healthy and safe. If you like what you hear today, please consider checking us out on social media after the event. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're on Instagram. You can also sign up for our news and updates at dmfi.org. And in just a minute, I'll turn it over to our board member, Archie Gottesman, to introduce our distinguished speakers today. But first, I wanted to let you know how you can ask questions during the event. If you have a question and you're joining us on Zoom, you can, you can type your question into the Zoom interface. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can type it into the comment section. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Archie Gottesman. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon. And I all just want to thank you all for joining us to reflect on the incredible work of former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in his quest to bring peace to Israelis and Palestinians. I'm Archie Gottesman, and I have the really distinct honor of serving on the National Board of Directors for the Democratic Majority for Israel. On this, the anniversary of Rabin's assassination, we recall the words of President Clinton's eulogy, where he said, now it falls to all of us who love peace and all of us who loved him to carry on the struggle to which he gave his life and for which he gave and for which he gave his life. This struggle, yeah. 25 years after his assassination, we gather today to hear from leaders who were part of Rabin's quest and who have picked up his mantle. Ambassador Dennis Roth played a leading role in shaping the U.S. involvement in the Middle East peace process and dealing directly with the parties in negotiations for more than 12 years. A highly skilled diplomat, Ambassador Ross was the U.S. point man on the peace process in both the George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton administrations. He was instrumental in assisting Israelis and Palestinians um, to reach the 1995 interim agreement he also successfully brokered the 1997 Hebron Agreement, facilitated the 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, and intensively worked to bring Israel and Syria together. He is now counselor and William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Prior to returning to the Institute in 2011, he also served two years as special assistant to President Obama and National Security Council Senior Director for the Central Region, and a year as Special Advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, in July 2011, former member of Knesset Stav Shafir joined a group of activists she had met on Facebook in protests over housing prices. Those protests soon turned into broad, a broad civil movement calling for profound change in the government's socioeconomic priorities which completely transformed the discourse in Israeli society. At the end of the summer of 2011, um, Stav, along with some of her fellow protesters, founded an extra parliamentary movement which conducted social change campaigns in the periphery, such as the campaign to extend application of free education to preschool children and the campaign for a socially conscious budget. About a year after the outbreak of the protests in New November 2012, Stav decided to run in the Labor Party primary and was elected to the um, eighth slot on the list. Sorry, in 2013, she was sworn in as a member of the 19th Knesset, becoming the youngest female Knesset member in Israel's history, where she served until 2019. Really, thank you both for joining us today. We look forward to your thoughts. I'm going to turn it over to Dennis first, after which we will hear from Stav and then open it up for questions. Um, Dennis, the floor is yours, and thank you. Um, thanks, and thanks for having me. This is a, an anniversary that needs to be recalled because of the significance of Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, and as we all know, he gave his life uh, for the cause of peace. I want to say three things about him uh, based on having spent an enormous amount of time with him. Uh, and they're, they're, they're points that tell you something about who he was, his character, but they also 
lend themselves very much to the whole issue of leadership. So the first point is I never worked with or dealt with any leader anywhere who was as intellectually honest as Yitzhak Rabin. It's not just that Yitzhak Rabin couldn't tell a lie, literally couldn't tell a lie. He wouldn't lie to himself. Uh, he was the kind of guy that who was so analytical that if he had thought something through, which was usually the case, if you were arguing with him uh, and trying to persuade him, you didn't have a chance to, to move him. But if reality demonstrated that he was wrong, he would come and say, you were right and I was wrong. And I can honestly say of all those I worked for and all those leaders I've worked uh, or negotiated with, I never heard that from anybody except Yitzhak Rabin. Sometimes I might hear, I was wrong because I listened to you, but I never heard somebody come back and say, you know what? You were right and I was wrong. But that was completely consistent with who he was, number one. Number two, this is someone who aspired to be an agronomist, a hydraulic engineer. You know, he won a, during the mandate, he won a scholarship to study at UC Berkeley. And I still recall uh, one night when he showed me around his roof garden where he'd installed a little irrigation system. And he was so proud of it. And he was telling me the story about that's what he had wanted to do with his life, but he didn't because of the War of Independence and the period leading up to it. He never went to Berkeley. He never pursued that. And the, and the fact that he lost half uh, of, the, of the brigade that he led in the defense of Jerusalem weighed very heavily on him. Uh, it colored his career. It made him stay in the military. He felt he owed a debt to, to the, all those who had died and paid such a terrible price so that the state could emerge out of its war of independence. He felt the obligation and the need to build the IDF, and he was the most important architect of building the Israeli Defense Forces. It carried with him a deep sense of responsibility to every single soldier in the IDF. Uh, he once said to me they, they often felt like they were his own grandchildren. Uh, even when he had his own grandchild in the military. And he took that sense of responsibility seriously. He also felt the need to pursue diplomacy because as he also would say frequently, he had to be able to look in the eyes of the parents of soldiers who were lost and tell them this was a sacrifice, sadly, that was absolutely necessary because every, di every diplomatic option had been pursued uh, and nothing more could have been done. This too weighed very heavily on him. The third point is that he was a leader in every sense of the world, word. And what I mean by that is leadership calls on someone to do many things. First and foremost, to know what's important, to be able to establish priorities and to be prepared to deal with those priorities even when it's politically difficult to do so. For Rabin, it's not that he was indifferent to the political realities, but if the issue uh, of what was important for Israel, if the national security interests of Israel, the fundamental interests of Israel were at stake, he would do what was important for Israel and the politics wouldn't mean much to him. Uh, he was a leader in the sense that he saw the world as it was, not as he might like it to be, but he set about to change the world as it was to make it more consistent with the world that he hoped to be. He was a leader in the sense that he always assumed responsibility. Uh, two examples stand out for me, although there are many more. One, when he was prime minister the first time in the 1970s, at the time of Entebbe, when the, when the commandos were sent off on the plane, and they're flying a couple thousand kilometers uh, toward Uganda, he wrote two statements, one announcing the success of the operation, the other announcing his resignation, because he, was, he knew this might go very badly, and he was assuming responsibility for it. I still recall, because I was there and actively involved, actually dealing with Arafat, uh, when Colonel Mahon Maxman was kidnapped uh, and uh, a, an operation was launched to save him, uh, and he was killed in the operation. And rather than have the IDF take the heat for it, or Ehud Barak, who was the chief of staff at that time, he immediately came out and said this was his responsibility. He made the decision. He approved the operation. This was Yitzhak Rabin, the, per the person and the leader, someone who was honest with himself, someone who saw the world as it was, someone who was determined to try to make peace if it was possible, who defined himself as someone whose ultimate success in the end, the ultimate flowering of his whole career, 
was to become not only a warrior, but to become a statesman who made peace. This was Yitzhak Rabin who defined priorities and was ready to face up to the realities and assume responsibility, always assume responsibility. Uh, in many ways, in so many ways, he represents a model for what all leaders should basically adopt. I'll stop there. Deb. Hi, um, and thank you very much for organizing this event today. I know it's a, it's a pretty unique week uh, for something like this to, uh, to be arranged, but actually, I guess it comes at the right time because what, well, I'm personally, I haven't slept for a week um, with the tension of the US elections, uh, obviously because what's happening in the US is, is greatly influential on, on Israel's um, life, security, politics, and everything else, but also because these elections um, also symbolized uh, the fight for democracy and the stability of our democratic institutions. And of course, it has a lot of influence on what's, what we're seeing here. When I think about um, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, um, I think of him in many ways as a child. Uh, when I was nine years old, my grandfather, who was also called Yitzhak, and uh, who was, Yitzhak Rabin was his commander uh, at, before the army at the independence war uh, to, to fund Israel. He took me uh, to the conference of all the warriors from the independence war and, and Yitzhak Rabin was there. And I was just a kid when my grandfather told me, would you like to meet the prime minister? And he took my hand and, and brought me to, to Yitzhak Rabin who sat there on a plastic chair um, red, completely red from the sun. It was a really hot day. And with a lot of patience, he just asked all the kids who were around him, what is our dream? What we want to see in the future for Israel? And as kids, at the time with the peace agreements, um, the Oslo agreements, and then the, the, the peace agreement with Jordan, we saw a leader who was willing to do everything for our country. We saw a kind of leadership who is truly inspiring because it makes you dream of what can happen and not just of the most terrible things that might happen. Um, it was a politics of hope. And, and even at a very difficult time um, on the security front and a very difficult time politically, Rabin managed to create that vision and make it very, very strong in the eyes of so many. And that was his path to taking Israel forward. Just imagining what Rabin could have done um, if, if he was not assassinated at the time and thinking of what Israel could have been today, what could be our relationship with our neighboring countries, what could have happened uh, between us and the Palestinians um, that creates, of course, a lot of sorrow. And Rabin was not just a leader on the Israeli-Palestinian front, also socially, um, he invested in a second term as prime minister, a lot of resources in building Israel's technological future, in narrowing down socioeconomic gaps, in uh, investing in our education system, thinking, knowing that education is the path for a stronger democracy and a stronger and a better future. He invested a lot in promoting the Arab citizens of Israel. Uh, and, and I think he's the leader who invested the most resources in doing that. Uh, in building our healthcare system, which now during the COVID, we see the incredible importance of that, of having a public, a social healthcare system. So he was remembered by that. And after his assassination, I think that what we call here the, the candle generation, the youth, the young people, the teenagers who went to the Rabin Square when he was, where he was assassinated and, and, light, and lit candles, um, in his memory, I believe this generation felt like our hope was just stolen from us. It took us a few years to get that uh, when we experienced our first political loss and then the second one, um, seeing how the leadership in Israel is becoming more and more corrupt, how the, you know, if just to compare some time ago, um, Netanyahu on an Instagram story uh, a social network for mainly teenagers, 
uploaded stories of, of, of that made jokes over um, corruption and bribery in politics. Um, that's the kind of political example that many young people get. And our politics has changed dramatically. I think for the left, Rabin's assassination was very much a trauma that was never actually um, ended. And the most important consequence of that was the loss of craving for power. It's like the democratic camp of Israel or the democratic, especially amongst the younger generation who experienced the assassination um, at quite an early age, lost hope in politics polit uh, completely. Didn't want to fight. Political power per was perceived for a very long time as a completely negative idea. Um, and I think we only now see a slight change in this historic path. In the demonstrations that we see today um, in Balfour in front of the prime minister's um, house and, and in front of the parliament, we see a participation, a growing participation of very young people, a generation that didn't know Rabin at all, uh, that, was, that, that was not alive when Rabin uh, was prime minister. But for them, and for them, the, the idea of politics is, 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 of course, a very negative idea. They don't trust politics at all. They don't trust the news. They don't trust anything that's related to it. And even the dream of peace is very far from them. And yet, their idea of power and, of, and their demand of a clean, um, more honest, more real leadership is extremely strong. And it's getting stronger and they're willing to fight for it. I think during the COVID for many Israelis, the understanding of what we were supposed to expect from a leadership has finally came back to us. So while we see our political system fragmented um, and, and, and confused and chaotic, outside in the civil society and on the streets, we see a new awakening of people to the idea that our future can look different. I think that's exactly Rabin's way. Continuing what Rabin started is of course, first and, first and foremost fighting for peace and willing to sacrifice. And, and the idea that as leadership, we, we should be willing to sacrifice in order to make peace happen. But the other tradition of Rabin that we have to keep very strongly is the idea that we have to fight hard for it that these kind of dreams are not just, they, they, they won't just happen out of nowhere. They will happen if we will put a lot of effort into doing that. And when it comes to the democratic camp here, it means we need to rebuild our infrastructure, rebuild our um, power and, and resources in, in the Israeli media and civil society in politics, rebuild our political parties, um, rebuild the belief among young people that peace is not just part of our history, it should be, it must be part of our future. And that peace in the Middle East is something that can happen, that it's plausible, that it has a majority. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to notice that 60% of Israelis support a two-state solution, but also 60% of Israelis believe that there is a majority against a two-state solution. Um, that's exactly the thing that we have to change and rebuild the idea that this kind of visions that Rabin vision is possible and the idea that in order to make it possible, we need to really work hard. Um, and on that note, I want to thank you in the democratic majority for Israel. I think we have a really strong challenge, really important challenge in front of us. And in order to strengthen the support in Israel um, amongst Democrats, we have to strengthen the voice of the democratic camp here in Israel and make Americans notice that there is a majority for peace. There is a majority for two state solution over here. Um, what we need is to change our strategy and, and that's our path forward. So thank you very much. Thank you both for those powerful opening remarks. I wanted to remind folks who are on the call, we'd love to get your questions. You can submit them through the Q&A feature on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, you can type it into the comments section. Dennis, I wanted to start with you. Can you tell us uh, where you were when you learned about Prime Minister Rabin's assassination? Yes, it was a <clears throat> Saturday morning. Uh, I actually was taking one of my kids to the dentist. Uh, at that time, 
we had these neat pages I used to always wear. Uh, and, you know, it was, we had gone through, there was nothing happening at that moment in terms of pressing decisions. So I was paged as I was driving back uh, from the dentist. And, uh, and I, I chose not to stop and answer, there's nothing really going on right now. So it'll wait till I get home. So it was about 15 minutes until I got home. I kept being paid and I walked in and my, my wife said the operations center, State Department is on the phone. Uh, and she said, Rabin's been shot. And, and I literally, it's like I couldn't absorb it. I said, what do you mean he's been shot? She said, he's been shot. And I got on the phone and they, and I was on and for just a couple of minutes and, uh, and then they said he was dead. Uh, and you know, I, I kind of immediately went into a kind of reflexive mode of dictating the statement that we would issue uh, in response to this. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I was doing this from the kitchen table and right after I finished sort of dictating this, I just started to cry. And um, even now I get emotional when I talk about it. <clears throat> um, and my kids had never seen me cry. And, yeah, and I was, I have to say, I was just overwhelmed by it. You know, I had spent so much time with him and he was, there was something that was also seemingly indestructible about him. First, he was fearless. Uh, when I, I used to, I used to meet him every Shabbat afternoon when I was in the region, because then he didn't want to talk about day-to-day -day decisions. He wanted to talk about sort of strategy and deeper issues about what should be done. And oftentimes there'd be a demonstration out there outside the building shouting. And he would always say to me, don't worry, it's about me, not you. Uh, and, you know, and I, I saw him one time after, you know, he'd been in a demonstration where the ornament had been ripped off the car, the car had been jostled. And I said to him, aren't you concerned about this? And he just, he dismissed it. <coughs> he dismissed it in terms of not its insignificance in terms of what was happening in the, in the country, but he dismissed it in terms of threats to him. He just, this was from his standpoint, you know, it's not that he didn't take it seriously. It's that, you know, on a personal basis, everything he did was seen through the larger lens of the country. I mean, even when you go back and when he was describing, you know, to the Knesset after the signing event at the White House, you know, he got up and he said, look, if this was Yitzhak Rabin living on Rav Ashi Street, uh, I would never have shaken his hand. But I have a lot of, I had a larger responsibility. I have a responsibility for the country. And we couldn't put our head in the sand. We couldn't be ostriches and somehow think that we didn't have to deal with the PLO. That was Yitzhak Rabin. Stav, I know you were um, you were a child uh, when Rabin was assassinated, and I know you talked about uh, meeting him uh, through grandfather. Do you remember the circumstances about where you were or when you learned about his assassination? Yes, of course. It's it's one of the things that there is that every Israeli remembers, um, because it's a kind of a heartbreak that there are no words to explain. Because it's it's a stronger heartbreaker than being the heartbreak than being sad about a person's uh, death. It's it's. I think even as kids, um, I was I was back at home with my parents after we went to the demonstration, um, and and even the very, the very idea of of of, of having our people here in Israel participating with such strong emotion and energy in those demonstrations for peace, understanding. And you know, when, when, when you fight for peace, there will always be those who will try to, to sabotage um, and, and, and damage the process. Uh, there will always be the extremists from, from uh, both sides of the conflict, uh, trying to scare us away from, from achieving this, trying to, to, to make peace uh, be compared or be, um, inherently related with, with terror, with fear, with, with, with that kind of trauma. 
and seeing so many people in Israel, although the fear of terror, um, still going to the square to protest for peace, to support Rabin, um, and in, in doing that, in signing the agreement, was, I, I think, the strongest uh, sense of hope that I felt in my life. And at the same time, seeing how this process was stopped by the action of one man who knew that what he was doing will stop, will end the process, was also um, shocking. And I think as, as children, of course, we didn't understand it in, in the same um, strength that, he, that we understand it now, seeing what happened in the past 25 years. But that was it, because we have to talk about what happened just after the assassination. Um, for, the, for Netanyahu's camp, Netanyahu was the head of the opposition at the time, um, they, the right, uh, the right wing camp saw immediately that the assassination and, and what was related to it might uh, create a big loss in the elections. And they developed a narrative that we need to talk about unity and talking about unity means that we're not mentioning the incitement that led to Rabin's assassination that was led by Netanyahu himself as the um, head of the opposition at the time that we don't talk about the incitement, we don't, we don't talk about the violence, um, the, the violent discourse about um, the conspiracies that were spread against Rabin and what he was doing and the peacemaking, the, the attempt to align uh, Rabin and peacemaking to a sense of them being traitors in Israel. Um, so under that headline, that narrative of alleged unity, uh, the discussion of what just happened uh, to our democracy, what just happened uh, to, to in our country was shut down. And during the elections that came uh, a, a few months after that, um, Perez who was, who was uh, the candidates almost didn't mention um, or tried not to point uh, at, the, at the incitement as a way of not making it to, um, politicized. Uh, well, Netanyahu's campaign said that Netanyahu is good for the Jews. So the usage of that incitement in our politics became the main strategy. Uh, and sadly, the left felt like, um, felt the loss and, and felt like, and, and adopted the kind of defeatist politics um, ever since. I want to go to a question uh, that we got here from Sandy Wasserman, and I'll throw it to both of you. Have either of you considered writing a children's book about Yitzhak Rabin? Mm -hmm. Much, much needed. That's a great idea, actually. Dennis, I think that that's for you. Uh, <clears throat> I have not thought about it, but maybe it's something I should think about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to unless you want to add anything there, I'm going to uh, ask you the next question. Do you think that the Israeli political system can produce another leader like a Rabin who will basically be willing, be willing to take necessary but difficult and maybe even divisive steps for peace? As Sav, I'll go to you first and then Dennis, I'd love for you to, to answer as well. Well, I think we don't have another choice. That's if we want to have a future for Israel. So, so that's the kind of leadership that we need. I think we, we shouldn't um, continue to search for um, the exact type of Rabin as a leader. There is a tendency amongst the Israeli left to, um, to feel like the only way to win elections is to have a military general uh, who would look as, 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 as similar as possible to Rabin and that would be the kind of leader that we can, um, that, that we will see winning elections. I think that the, the last several election rounds we have uh, for the last year proved that it's not really the case. Um, we need to, the first thing is to see reality, is to understand that we have to change our strategy completely. I think we have a lot to learn from what happened in the US in the last four years, um, seeing the way the democratic camp rebuild its strategy, understood the historic challenge um, that, that you are confronting um, and, and managed to do this. We have to look at it um, and, and reach our conclusions and, and start to act uh, differently from the way that we acted before. I think we, we have many leaders 
in civil society who, who lead with the spirit of Rabin. We have many people who fight with all of their energy um, and with a willing to, um, to sacrifice and do everything that's possible uh, in order to achieve a change here. Most of them are really afraid of politics. Our political system did not manage to create um, the support needed for new leadership to, to step into um, politics and, and, and stay there. Um, there is a lot of fear amongst the left from, from younger voices and younger leaders from, from entering that sphere. And we need to change it. And I feel that the demonstrations we see now are the, are, are the beginning of that. Um, there is a beginning of an understanding that political power is important, um, that we should not be afraid of that. And what we need to add to that understanding is that the biggest and most crucial fight that we need to do is not BBS or no, but it's peace in our future. That that is the most urgent need for Israel in order to um, remain um, democratic, in order to have uh, our strong democratic institutions, to have a Jewish majority, to have uh, equality among our country and, and, and peace inside and, and outside of our country. Uh, and, and we need to get that urgency um, to be felt. And we, you know, to make it happen, it should be led by um, voices that come from all parts of our society, not just the um, security, uh, uh, security personas uh, who, who lead this discussion, which is very much, it's very much led by uh, the former security leader, leadership of Israel. Uh, but by voices who come from all around the country, from teachers, from workers, from young people, uh, that's that's the train that we, the trend that we need to get in, into our society. You know, I would I would echo some of what Stav is saying. I do think that there is a because security has always been the dominant feature within Israel for understandable reasons. You look at the neighborhood, uh, you look at the threats that are not fanciful; they're quite real. Uh, wars in the, in the Middle East are not fought in a limited way because so often they're about the very issue of identity, which becomes existential. Uh, so it's not surprising that you want to have a high level of comfort with the leader understanding the security situation and having a sense of strategy and so forth. It's inconceivable in a country that uh, is legitimately called a startup nation that has produced cutting edge technologies in literally every area that there wouldn't be a leader out there highly capable because there's so many successful people who've proven that. Uh, so the question is, how do you affect that? Now, Stav is, Stav is offering one sort of uh, explanation and prescription for this. And I guess what I would add is, I do think it'll become easier when we're in the post Netanyahu era. And I say that for two reasons. One, he's proven to be a kind of master of Israeli politics. Whatever, whatever you think of him, his ability uh, to maintain where he is, uh, you know, to say he has nine lives would be an understatement. So he has this capacity to maneuver and, and connect at least with what is a strong constituency, number one. Number two, he kind of takes up and has for a long time all the political oxygen. It's hard for anybody else to emerge. I can't tell you how often when I've been in Israel and I raise questions like this, I'll be, I'll be so, well, you know, but who else is there? Nobody else uh, has the experience or can do what he does on the world stage. Uh, and as I often say, well, nobody else has had a chance to do what he does. So I think that he is, he has been this kind of presence. And when he's no longer uh, the prime minister, I do believe that the, the ability to create a whole lot of new energy into the political system will be there. So the kind of things Todd, that you're talking about are more likely to express themselves with political success later on. But your point, which is right, you got to build the infrastructure for it now. You can't wait for that moment. You have to be in a position where you have basically built the right kind of parties, begun to create the, the right kind of focus on, on issues, identify key people as being capable of dealing with those issues. That's all part of basically building an infrastructure for being able to compete effectively politically. But I, I don't have the slightest doubt that there are other people highly capable in Israel who could be effective prime ministers. 
I would like to add something to that. Um, I completely agree with you, Dennis. I think what should be understood about Israeli democracy right now is that we can't pretend to be the same strong democracy we were a few years ago. Our democratic institutions, um, our parliament is at its weakest point ever in Israel's history. Uh, it's completely controlled and dominated by the government. Um, there is no, the, the separation that's supposed to be between the two entities is broken completely. Uh, so parliament does, hardly has any power today. Our Supreme Court was threatened by Netanyahu for the past 10 years uh, in the most severe way. Um, and is, it is still exists and, and, and tries to be strong, but, but I'm afraid it's not as strong as it used to be. Uh, and our media, possibly, well, of course, the most important keeper of democracy um, is um, almost completely dominated by Netanyahu's narratives um, and, and power. So when I'm talking about infrastructure, if we want to have a leader coming from the left and leading this country, that infrastructure has to be completely transformed. Um, we need to rebuild, a to build a strategy like from the very beginning of how we change the balance um, in all of those systems um, and, and, and take some of the balance back. Uh, we need to, because at the moment, I think what happens, the, there is, an internal attack amongst the, the democratic camp of Israel against every kind of new leadership. Um, an internal, almost an immediate disappointment from every, and, and suspicion towards every new leadership. So if we want to change that, um, and, and of course that suspicion is, is completely legitimate. I mean, Rabin's old party, the Labour Party, which I was part of um, for, for most of my time in politics, um, entered Netanyahu's government after just recently after it promised um, our um, supporters that they would never enter and, and collaborate with Netanyahu under um, his corruption allegations. Um, so the disappointment and the lack of trust amongst people, including within the democratic camp uh, in our politicians and leaders is of course understood. So what we need to do is to build these parties completely anew. We need to create collaboration between Jewish and Arab candidates and leaders um, that has to break the, the old um, political structures of how a coalition is being built in Israel. Uh, we need to get younger candidates from these two societies um, and, 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 and get them into leadership and change the political balance, change the discourse of what left and right be as, as both of these terms are no longer serving the ideological substance behind them. So, so that's the kind of work. And I think that you, um, all of you could be uh, of really great help in achieving that, um, that the strength of, of the collaboration between um, Democrats in Israel and in the US is, is crucial to make this work. Um, and of course the balance is always very delicate because as Israelis, we will always collaborate with every elected American president. It's, it's, it will always be part of our interest. Um, but at the same time, in parallel to this interest, we have the, a very strong interest in the continuation and the future of democracy worldwide. And, and in order to achieve that, well, the, the challenge is not really over now um, after or during the, the late stage of the election in the US. Um, we still have this challenge and we definitely have this challenge here in Israel and, and we need to have a very strong collaboration if we want to achieve that. Wanted to read uh, one comment and then I wanted to go to another question uh, from Israel Meyerstein. The loss of Rabin reminded me of when JFK died when I was a teen. It was the death of his dream for Israel and was as was JFK's for a more democratic America. I wanted to uh, go ahead and ask about uh, some more recent developments uh, with Israel and Israel's neighbors. We have a question from Jonathan Bernstein. How do recent normalization agreements fit in with Rabin's legacy? Is it consistent with his vision for peace? Dennis, do you want to start? Yeah, can I start on that one? Yeah. Please. Uh, the short answer is, of course, anybody who thinks that without Oslo, uh, the broader normalization process would have begun is kidding themselves. 
I mean, it was once the Palestinians began to deal with the Israelis, then it became thinkable for the other Arab states to do the same. So it isn't that normalization immediately occurred, it didn't. But dealing with Israel became something that was much more a natural part of the landscape. Now, what really transforms it beyond being able to say, okay, we can deal with Israel because the Palestinians do, was the sense of threat, the common sense of threat from Iran. Now, I'll remind you, in December of 1992, Yitzhak Rabin gave a speech that was focused exclusively on Iran. And what he focused on was the threat that Iran posed in the region through, uh, through its proxies already, with its ideology, uh, with its terrorism, and even, and even raised early on the issue of their nuclear program. So he was identifying in 1992, December 1992, what was a threat that also became a huge impetus for the Gulf Arab states in particular to begin to deal with Israel under the radar screen. What's different today uh, is that while security may have been the initial impetus for creating a relationship, other factors are now producing a much more acute interest and one that is that can be manifested publicly in having relations with Israel. There, there are, I would say, two points here, just to, again, explain all this. One is, in, in the aftermath of COVID, uh, with health issues, with profound economic problems, with climate change producing real drought, you have Arab states looking at Israel in terms of how it can be helpful on health, uh, on building tech-based, digitally-based societies, uh, on how it can contend with water shortages, how it can help with food security issues, uh, cyber issues. Across the board, there isn't just a security interest in terms of dealing with Israel. There are these other interests now that are gonna become stronger, not weaker. Now, that reflects that Arab states are increasingly gonna focus on the issue of their national interests and not allow the Palestinians to determine whether or not they can have relations with Israel. Uh, at the same time, they're not nearly as concerned as they were in the past about the Palestinian ability to arouse public sentiment against them. Again, what we're seeing is the Palestinian issue hasn't disappeared, but it's reduced as an issue of importance. Now, for people on the Israeli right, they say, ah, we won, they've lost. Uh, and it's true, the Palestinians, if they don't look in the mirror and make some adjustments are gonna be increasingly left behind. Unfortunately for Israel, the Palestinian loss is not an Israeli gain. It may be with the Arabs, but the Palestinians are still there. They're not going anyplace. So Israel will still have a Palestinian problem. The two-state outcome is not a favor that's done to the Palestinians. It is part of ensuring the Zionist mission and sense of identity of being both Jewish and democratic. One state for two people is basically the end of the Zionist mission, the Zionist dream. So what's going on now reflects a changing landscape in the region, but it also represents an opportunity because the Arabs can do several things. They can provide a cover for Palestinians. Palestinians, because of their historic narrative, uh, identify themselves as the injured party, the party that for whom uh, has suffered the great injustice. They're the weaker party and they think they shouldn't have to make concessions. That should be on the Israeli side or someone should de deliver it. So they need a kind of cover for any decision that is a hard decision to make. So Arabs can help in that regard. Arabs can help in terms of outreach to Israel, but here's where I think we need to be thinking creatively. What was overlooked was the idea that the UAE in making the decision to normalize created linkage. It said, we'll normalize, but no annexation. Annexation has to be off the table. You know, Bibi can say it's paused, not paused, it's off the table uh, and it's off the table it was off the table even if Trump was reelected because it would put at risk uh, the, what he had achieved, what his administration achieved. Certainly it's off the table uh, with Biden. And Bibi has said, we can't proceed with it over the opposition of the Americans. Linkage was created. The, the Emirates made a decision to say, we're prepared to normalize, but there's a relationship to what Israel does with the Palestinians. In this case, a step they don't take. Now, other Arab states can say, other Arab states can say, as we do more public outreach towards Israel, because not many won't simply go from where they are to full normalization. By the way, the UAE's relationship with Israel was built over the last 12 years. 
So it's not like they immediately leap into, into normalization. The point here is the right kind of American diplomacy would say, you know what, we're gonna, one way we can break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians is as Arab states are prepared to do public outreach towards Israel, what are the steps that Israel can do towards the Palestinian? Uh, the more politically significant the step that is taken towards the Israelis, the more politically significant the step towards the Palestinians. It will become even easier in a political context in, in Israel if the whole climate of the region is changing. I said before, if you're an Israeli, you have every right to be worried about security. And there are still profound threats. But as the region changes, as Israel is seen as an as a integral part of that region, as Arabs are reaching out to Israelis, the public psychology in Israel will also undergo some change. And the political tailwind for an Israeli government taking steps towards the Palestinians becomes easier. We should be, in a sense, the, the one who helps to broker this. Uh, Arab steps towards Israel, Israeli steps towards Palestinians. That can break the stalemate. And I'll just conclude by saying, we have not had direct negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians since the spring of 2014. So no wonder there's a sense of hopelessness, no possibility. Uh, Stav can say the majority of Israelis still favor you know, the two-state solution, but they also, the majority of Israelis think it's never gonna happen. So on the Palestinian side, there's a complete mirror image of that. The key at this point is for us to reestablish a sense of possibility and what's happening with the Arab states is not gonna be reversed because it's being driven by their own interests. Uh, and the reality here is we can take advantage of that to also uh, move forward with the process and resume a process on peacemaking between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, do you have anything to add about the no recent normalization with some of the Arab states? Well, I think one thing we have to notice, although there is, I mean, you're right, Dennis, about the fact that most Israelis do not believe that there is a chance for, for a two-state solution now, but we have to also look at um, what happened in the last few years from a different perspective. Um, although the Trump administration supported every step um, uh, that Netanyahu's government um, uh, wanted, there was no annexation of the settlements in the West Bank. Um, it didn't happen. Even President Trump and his administration was very supportive of the settlers movement, um, did not annex them, uh, did not support an annexation of them to Israel, knowing that an annexation would be the end of the Zionist uh, dream. Uh, there won't be a Jewish majority anymore, there won't be a Jewish, uh, an Israeli democracy um, after an annexation. So actually, although, I mean, we talked, I, I, I talked about the, the failure of the left in the last 25 years to, to start a new leadership, but also, there was also a failure, um, a very big failure of, of the settlement movement. Um, if we look at the goals that the settlement movement put to itself uh, 30 years ago, so they wanted to settle, to create as many, a lot of settlements in order to prevent um, a Palestinian state from, from ever happening, um, and they also wanted to settle in the hearts of Israelis. They want to be um, mainstream within Israeli politics. This was never, none of these goals uh, has ever, was ever achieved. Uh, when we look at the settlements today, so they are about 4% of the Israeli uh, society, but less than 2% is the real ideological uh, settlement. They never achieved real sustainability. So 90, over 90% 90 of the settlers work inside Israel, inside the Green Line, or in municipal and government jobs. They hardly have any um, sustainable businesses, agriculture, um, tourism, the, the, this hardly exists. So, so their existence is completely dependent upon Israeli taxpayer, uh, tax, tax money, which in most cases um, is being transferred to investment in the settlements with no transparency and, and with no actual formal decision um, I had to deal with this with that a lot as a member of the finance committee uh, from the opposition in parliament, uh, where I exposed a whole chain network of corrupt budgetary transfers of money to the settlements. And the reason it was made in secret is because the government knows that mo the majority of Israelis would not support that. They don't have a majority agreement um, for 
moving so much money to settlement building. Uh, most Israelis do not support that because the settlements were never, never actually became mainstream. In, in Israeli politics and in, in, in Israeli life. For most Israelis, we don't travel there as, um, uh, on a regular basis even. Um, so although, yes, a majority of Israelis do not believe that peace is plausible, they also don't want the settlements and they don't have very strong feelings towards them. So I think that between, like on that line, uh, we can move towards the understanding that peace is the most stable and plausible solution for our future. And, and part of that is to be able to celebrate peace. So the normalization agreements in Israel were perceived partly in a celebration because uh, the more normalization we have with the Arab countries, it's, it's better for our future and our vision for the future and, and opens many new opportunities for also for peace with the Palestinians, but for, for better lives in the region, of course. But at the same time, it was perceived with a lot of suspicion because um, it was not transparent, because the ideas and the interests behind the deal um, were not put formally in front of Israelis in, in any, at any point. But we can also build a different narrative from that. When Netanyahu, after four years of Trump in office, um, sees his um, uh, success in peace agreements, with Arab countries and not in annexation of the settlements in the West Bank. That's actually the narrative that we on the democratic camp in Israel want to see. Peace is the only plausible um, and, and, and good way for, for our future. And it's the same thing as it goes you know, with Sudan or, or the Arab Emirates, it, it goes to, to the peace with the Palestinians. We need to adopt that narrative and, 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 and talk about it as, as the path towards success. Uh, at the same way, and you know, during the COVID, we saw how fast people get used to really difficult changes in our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, we moved to talk through this, through Zoom. Um, children learn through Zoom in schools. We, we got used even to lockdowns and to really severe changes in our day-to-day, -day, in our job, in everything. Maybe that's actually an opportunity to start getting ourselves used to good changes in our lives. Um, seeing the borders of Israel in a different way, seeing the incentives that could be developed now um, in the aftermath of COVID uh, for how we're basically interdependent in this region and we need to find better paths for collaboration economically and, 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 and security wise. So I think we need to take that and as an opportunity for us to build a new narrative for why peace is the only way. I'm hoping we have time for just maybe one or maybe even two more questions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about US politics and uh, Iran. We have a question from Joseph Shanling. Concern has been expressed in Israel that the US will now rejoin the Iran agreement. And this will then result in Israel having to go to war with Iran to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. What can we expect from the Biden administration to do to address this concern? Dennis, I'm gonna start with you. I know that you worked on this issue uh, in the Obama administration. Yeah. Um, first, I think anybody who believes that there'll be a rush to an agreement with the Iranians, uh, first doesn't understand the Iranians, uh, and secondly, probably doesn't understand Joe Biden. When he talked in the campaign about compliance for compliance, what that means is there can't be any sanctions relief unless the Iranians are back in compliance with the JCPOA, which did impose limits. Just to put this in perspective, even though I did have some questions about the JCPOA, uh, the reality is that the Iranians today have 10 times the amount of low enriched uranium on hand that they were permitted to have under the JCPOA and 10 times the amount that they had after they implemented uh, the JCPOA, meaning that their breakout time uh, to, being, to being able to produce a a fissile, uh, a fissile material for a nuclear bomb went from 12 months down to about three and a half. It's interesting that uh, we didn't hear any of that during uh, from Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, mostly because I think, A, he liked the pressure that was put on Iran, but B, also, he also understood that publicly challenging Donald Trump was actually not a politically wise thing to do. The point is that when, when uh, I don't know if I can call him president-elect yet, but when, <laughs> when Biden 
says compliance for compliance, it starts with the Iranians having to get back into compliance. Now that's not as simple as it sounds because A, they have to get rid of this. Uh, they now have 2000 grams of uh, kilograms of low enriched uranium. Either they have to dilute it, which takes time, or they have to ship it out of the country. Uh, in Fordo, they were only permitted to run small experiments. They began in, enriching again in Fordo. They're gonna have to shut that down. Uh, they have two cascades of advanced centrifuges that they weren't supposed to install until the year 2025. They installed it this year. They're going to have to take that down. And that, by the way, is more complicated not to take down, but because five years ahead of schedule, they had been building a knowledge base uh, and, and an ability to make these advanced centrifuges work well before they were supposed to be able to do that. So getting back into compliance is not quite as straightforward as it might seem. And that even begs or misses the, the question that the Iranians are gonna to come to a new administration and say, you owe us because we stayed in the agreement one year after, uh, after Trump pulled out. Uh, yeah, then we, we began to move away, but you owe us. We, we, we need sanctions relief up front. Now, maybe the administration will provide it easier to, to allow humanitarian assistance to go which in theory, they were supposed to be permitted under any circumstance practice because of fears of sanctions. Many of those who could have provided it were reluctant to do so. So maybe there'll be something there, but the idea that there'll be quick sanctions relief without the Iranians getting back into compliance isn't realistic, number one. Number two, that suggests that you're gonna have a negotiation that takes some time. Number three, there's also has to be a perspective that even if you can get back into the JCPOA, and, the, and I think Vice President Biden has made it clear he wants a successor agreement because he does recognize the problems with some of the sunset provisions. Uh, the fact is nothing's gonna be sustainable unless you also deal with Iran's behavior in the region. I'm not suggesting you can have one big agreement where on the nuclear and the regional behavior, I am suggesting if there isn't at least parallel discussions that don't that produce some understandings, at least limited understandings, you're gonna find any nuclear agreement very difficult to sustain because we will inevitably end up sanctioning the Iranians for what they're doing in the region. They will then cry foul and you'll be right back to where you started. So this is a complicated issue. There won't be, in my mind, you're not gonna see early diplomatic achievements. First thing the Biden administration will do is line up and have a common position with the British and the French and the Germans. The Trump administration was very successful in building great economic pressure on Iran, but they ended up in the process of isolating us, not the Iranians. The best indication of that, we couldn't get the British, the French, and the Germans to support us on the issue of extending the arms embargo, the conventional arms embargo. The last thing Iran should be able to do is buy and sell arms around the region, but we couldn't get our traditional allies to support us in that because they thought it would end up breaking the overall JCPOA. So reestablishing a common front, isolating the Iranians politically will also build our leverage in terms of dealing with them. Uh, did you want to add anything to that or even close us out with any thoughts about uh, Rabin? Oh, uh, that was an incredibly interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, I think there is a lot of work I, I would like to say when uh, elected, uh, new president-elect uh, Biden will get into office, we will have a lot of work on rebuilding the connection and, and the trust um, here in Israel in um, not just the relationship uh, with the US because um, some of what the, the current government in Israel did was to, for the first time, uh, I think in the history of our relationship with the US, uh, to damage the bipartisanship um, uh, of, of, of the connection with Israel, to, to treat um, or to, and it started during the Obama administration, um, to, to try to portray uh, the democratic camp of, of the US um, as not part um, and is not supportive of Israel's security interests, which is of course an idea that was um, full with fake news um, and, 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 and not based on facts. Uh, but sadly, uh, it became quite popular amongst many Israelis. Um, the growing support of, of initiatives like the BDS, the boycott against Israel also helped the Israeli right. Um, because the more there was support with the boycott against Israel, the more the right in Israel could say, oh, you see the, the, 
American population or the, the, the global, the international community um, is not seeing our, our, our security interest, is not seeing Israel, is not accepting the idea of the existence of Israel at all. And that only brought more fear and more support towards the right in Israel. Um, so we need to work on rebuilding these connections um, on, when that goes to both sides. Um, on strengthening this connection, on strengthening, the, I think one of the biggest questions of, of, of Biden would be to um, recreate the idea of global responsibility um, and recreate the idea of democratic responsibility um, over in overcoming the biggest challenges of our times. Uh, security is one of them. Uh, technology is the second, is another one of them, and democracy would be in, um, uh, in a strong one, and of course, climate change. Uh, which all of them demand um, global collaboration. Uh, so, so I see the current uh, process and fight for, for a new form of democracy um, and, and a global collaboration towards that as, as part of that and rebuilding our relationships as to make sure that Israel um, and the US are partners um, on security and our partners on that, that democracy um, is crucial, you know, to make that happen. Thank you so much, Stav Shafir, former member of the Knesset and Ambassador Dennis Ross. I'm going to bring on our board co-chair Ann Lewis to close us out. Thank you all so much for joining us. I know we're a couple of minutes over time. Thank you, Dennis and Stav. Thank you for joining us, for sharing your thoughts and insights, for helping us remember the legacy of Prime Minister Rabin. I'm Ann Lewis, as you heard. I'm proud to serve as a co-chair of the Democratic Majority for Israel. So this week, we've spent a lot of time focused on our own elections, and the choices we have to make as a country. That makes us an appropriate day to think about the difference that leadership makes. Courageous, visionary leadership. And that's why we think of, as we honor the legacy of Yitzhak Rabin, remembering all he did and all he sacrificed on behalf of peace for his beloved country. At DMFI, we are committed to honoring and emulating these ideals. We have a lot to do in the days to come. We hope you will choose to be part of that work by lending your voice, your activism, and your support to our, to our efforts. Thank you again for joining us and to our distinguished guests, Shabbat Shalom. We look forward to talking with all of you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, John. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dennis and Stav. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Glad yeah. to do it. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Good luck, too.